outside the box standing by to join me is Mark Tinker. He's an American television producer and director. He was an executive producer and regular director on the HBO series Deadwood. Prior to Deadwood, he also was director and producer at NYPD Blue and so much more. Welcome to the show, Mark. Hi, how are you? Great. Little did I know, all these shows that I would watch, you were behind them. Well, I was one of the people back there uh, trying to, to do our jobs, yes. That's amazing. Give me a sense of where it all started for you when you had this desire to go in this direction, this career path. Uh, probably when I was in single digits age-wise, I watched a lot of TV and then I thought, wow, my, my uh, father's in television. Maybe I should do that because I'm pretty familiar with how to turn it on and off. And, uh, and uh, it seems kind of fun. So uh, those were the days where you didn't have TV in your classroom either. Yeah. So to, to, to consider working in television or, or making some kind of uh, show was, uh, was very appealing. Now, um, you mentioned your dad, Grant. Um, was, was this a relationship where you would um, go with him to sets or you just were admiring his work? I mean, what, how, did, how was that an influence? It's a sad, sad story uh, of, him, of my parents getting divorced. I'm kidding. It's not that sad. Okay. Uh, and I was going to grab my Kleenex. <laughs> yeah, <right>. Me too. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he was living in California and I was in Connecticut and uh, I knew at some point uh, I would wind up out there uh, working. And, uh, uh, and so I, when I would visit him, he would take me to sets. He would take me, you know, uh, show me around, uh, uh, you know, a studio lot and things like that. That's exciting. Uh, and he would send us scripts to read and, uh, you know, just, I guess, be, trying to be a connected dad. And yeah. uh, so then when I went to Syracuse and, and, and studied film and television uh, and other things, um, I just couldn't wait to get done with school because I knew that uh, anything I was doing there was really um, just marking time. Yeah. I felt, uh, although there was plenty of productive stuff and plenty to learn, uh, I will admit not taking advantage of it enough, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, but uh, when I uh, left college, I think uh, it was a matter of a couple of weeks before I was in California. Whoa, that's job fast. Was. Jobless at that point. Oh, jobless. Okay. Yeah. You're on the beach. I was actually. My dad had a house on the beach and I was living with him. And uh, that was quite a, 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 a culture shock coming from, uh, coming from Syracuse to uh, Malibu Colony. And uh, so uh, I was, I was uh, trolling around for work mm -hmm. and found out they were looking for people at this local station doing graphics for the news, which which I ended up doing for a little bit okay. before becoming a production assistant on a, a couple of network TV shows at a company called Lorimar. So, and then from there, it just, you went from project to project? I went for, I, I sort of worked my way up the ladder of uh, knowledge wise, and then uh, got enough, uh, had enough contacts at that point uh, to be able to uh, secure positions elsewhere. And, uh, you know, having a father in the business didn't hurt, but he wasn't helping me. Uh, uh, fortunately, I suppose for me, the fact that some of the people he worked with uh, were willing to help me or at least offered help uh, was certainly a, a good thing for me. That's great. Were there certain types of shows that you were gravitate, gravitating towards? Or just uh, the I work? actually like the comedies, but okay. a, 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 a comic writer, Mm -hmm. comic director, comic, they are a different breed than, than most of dramatic, uh, uh, dramatically oriented people. And b when I worked on the Bob Newhart show and spent time in the writer's room, listening to how they uh, structured a joke, mm -hmm. how they structured the stories, uh, their minds were, uh, uh, it blew my mind because mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine how they worked that way to come up with those jokes, to come mm -hmm. up with those lines. It's, it wasn't a linear thing right? to come up with a joke line. It was something that bounced around in their head and came out at an angle and uh, was a joke. Yeah. So it was that was pretty fascinating. And it also made me realize, uh, okay, I'm semi-funny, but you know, I'm not like these guys. So it's almost it, like improv. It's this spark. A little bit. A little you know? bit. Yeah. yeah. 
And so I, uh, I didn't, uh, I did not, uh, I didn't shed any tears when uh, dramatic stuff came my way instead. Yeah. Not that I was shunned from the, from the comedy, but uh, opportunities were made available, which I took. Sure. Now your stepmom, Mary Tyler Moore, she, what a talented actress. Very, and a lovely lady. I, I, I miss her. Uh, she actually lived in Greenwich, uh, quite oh. close to here where I am in Connecticut, um, eventually. And uh, she was helpful and, and very supportive. And uh, um, yeah, she was everything you thought she was. Yeah. She, and more. And very her good. sense of timing and comedy and acting was spectacular. I totally agree. And there, I've worked with a couple of people who I felt, Kate Walsh being one of them, mm -hmm. had, had a very similar uh, sense of timing and, and, and uh, approach to, to funny stuff that Mary did. Um, you wouldn't think she would have had that, Mary, because mm -hmm. uh, you know, her background was very strict Catholic upbringing, Catholic girl school, you know, raised in Brooklyn for a good part of her early childhood and then into California. But there was, other than that she was a dancer, she was really not, you know, a steeped in show business. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Then she started out doing commercials and some modeling and this and that. Remember, she was Happy Hot Point in the uh, Hot Point Appliances. I didn't know about that. A little pixie about that tall that would oh. dance on top of the stove. Oh, cute. Cute. And then, um, so, so for you, you, you mentioned Kate Walsh. She's, she was in Grey's Anatomy, correct? Yes, and uh, private practice. Yes, two great shows. Two pretty good shows, yeah. yeah. What was it like working on those shows? Um, when I first did a Grey's episode, they were not Grey's yet. They were just oh. a show that was preparing to go on the air. Oh, okay. Or, or excuse me, I, I take that back. They had been on the air and it was a bit of a groundswell. It was, I did a later episode of the first season, but they weren't the juggernaut that they are now. Got or it. have been for years. Mm -hmm. And so they were, um, they weren't cocky, but they were con very confident uh, in themselves for a show that was that early on. And, uh, you know, a show really grows as time goes on. The writers learn how to do things. The actors yeah. learn how to do things with the characters. And so uh, I, I felt uh, it was a very uh, secure environment that was pretty fun. And there was yeah. a lot of young people on the show, you know, younger than me, certainly. And uh, so that was invigorating. And as far as how that was shot, everything, there's so much movement. Is that something that you brought to the table or? No, that uh, I, I'll, I'll go back to saying elsewhere on that, where we okay. tried to do a lot of movement because, you know, we couldn't do action sequences. So we tried to keep people literally moving mm -hmm. uh, and, and sort of um, uh, fool people with phony, uh, uh, you know, into uh, thinking there was something more going on with some literally movement. And then Rod Holcomb on the pilot of ER um, perfected that with uh, a, a fellow named That's Guy right. B, who was a terrific Steadicam operator. Mm -hmm. And they really, uh, they, they, they introduced the idea of a lot of fast paced motion, a lot of fast cuts, fast speaking people, you know, dialogue was zipping by medical terms and otherwise. Uh, and so I think that was the template for uh, Grace. Yes. And uh, Grace sort of followed that along and, and was able to take it to the next level, certainly story-wise, but uh, in, in a similar vein. And mm -hmm. I will say that, that St. Elsewhere would have been a little more dynamic had we been able to afford a steady cam in those days. By the time ER came around, that was much more affordable. Yeah. And they did most of our stories. Oh, okay. Uh, and some, there's only so many medical stories, like there are only so many legal stories. You know, we killed Santa Claus, ER killed Santa Claus. You know, you had uh, inner uh, uh, nesting warfare within the hospital. You had relationships with it. You know, it's all the stuff that you would expect. And Grace did the same thing and brought it to a new level uh, and and disguised the um, I don't want to say soap opera nature of the show, but disguised the, the ongoing drama, the continuing drama nature of it uh, uh, very well and told good stories with characters people related to. Got it. 
And I didn't, uh, I just followed their lead and, you know, tried to make it as creative as I could. I, uh, that was uh, Peter Horton and other people, uh, you know, Shonda and, and the writers doing the rest of it. Do you get asked a lot of questions from, from students, even alumni from Syracuse about how do you get an acting role on these, on these shows or how do you break in? That must be hard to answer. Well, it's a little bit harder for me because it's changed in the past several years uh, about how to approach things. And God knows that uh, uh, with all the uh, political correctness and then there's diversity hiring and this and that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I will bl bluntly say that uh, old white guys like me are not uh, the flavor of the day uh, these days, which is fine. I had my shot. Um, I think that the pendulum has swung a little too far, but you know what? Everyone's got to get their chance. Yeah. And, and in order to be a writer or a director or an actor or a producer in the business today, you need to have a little bit of uh, luck. You need to have a lot of bit of smarts and ability and, uh, you know, network with people, yeah. find uh, um, opportunities. You'll find them in the weirdest places, you know. Uh, like where? Uh, well, we hired a guy uh, who was a uh, waiter in a restaurant in, in Los Angeles who became a, a production assistant. And then, wow. uh, you know, he, this is a guy who went to Penn and the Wharton School. So he was not a dope. And here he was in L.A. being a waiter and running some marathons and this and that. And the next thing you know, he's writing scripts for us. And then he goes on to create uh, a couple of shows for CBS and one for NBC. Amazing. You know, wins Emmys and, yeah. uh, and uh, like that. So it can happen anyway. A lot of people back into it. I yeah. would say uh, if, you're, if your background is science, it's less likely, although there have been plenty of doctors who were writers and stopped being doctors and became writers. I knew That's several of those. Oh, I have heard that, like a, you know, a doctor who became a medical writer on a show. I think Neil Baer, uh, I, I feel like he was a doctor on ER, mm -hmm. but regardless of that, uh, whether I'm right on that, there was a guy named Sandor Stern, uh, uh, who I knew, another fellow named Dennis, he, he was on LA Law and NYPD Blue, I'm gonna forget his last name, but guys, you know, were lawyers and doctors, Bill Finkelstein uh, was yeah. a lawyer, David Kelly was a lawyer, uh, and well, they became right. writers and very yeah. successful, as we all know. Mm -hmm. I think so. some of the best advice I got, um, I think I had mentioned this to you, I was taking uh, a commercial workshop, at, um, commercial acting workshop, and a casting director told all of us, have a full life, because you don't want to get into these audi auditions and feel or look so desperate, like, I really want this, you know, and that you're dying to make a good impression. Just prepare, do your best stuff, you know, and, but do other things. Absolutely. And, and, be prepared for uh, disappointment. You, yeah. you have to have a, a high level of resolve and uh, resilience because more times than not, you won't get the gig. Yeah. Especially if you're an actor uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this, you know, from friends of mine who are actors, from being on the producing side. And, you know, you, you have readings and you say, well, these people were really identically talented. I, I could go with either one. Unfortunately, you don't know which one has to make their rent, right? You know, so you, you're sort of, you know, you make a decision, and maybe it's a big deal in someone's life that they got it or didn't. Yes. Uh, uh, my wife's an actress, so I've uh, I've dealt with that too. Sure. But uh, um, it, it's you got to be willing to stick it out. And frankly, I would make a plan of you know, as long as you can, two years, five years, 10 years, mm -hmm. and say, if I'm not, you know, in, in, in it by then, if I'm not being fulfilled and actually working in, in, you know, that right. field, uh, maybe think of something else. Yeah, absolutely. But live a life, live a life, have things to do. And that makes you a more interesting person anyway. It definitely does. Yeah. That's good advice. My most exciting moment was on a Friday, getting a call from my agent saying, you have an audition for Modern Family on a Friday going to the Fox lot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I even gonna make it in time? And then getting in and just being so overly excited and then just realizing, you know what? Just do your thing, leave, that's it. You have no control over this. You know, you just do the best work you can do. Did you get the part? No. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a rejection and here you are. And here still, I am. Uh, fighting away. Exactly. The, you know, uh, 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 
that's a hard thing to do. And uh, you can tell when actors come in if they're a little desperate or, you know, yeah. if they've got flop sweat or. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some come in and it's like second nature to them. They just, you know, they just come in and own the room. Right. And some actors get thrown by the littlest comment. You may get a note when you come in that completely contradicts the way you've decided to play the scene. Yes. You need to be, you need to be flexible and, uh, and, and go with the flow. Right. And, uh, and if you, if you don't give them what they want the first time, listen closely, because hopefully they will give you a direction and you'll be able to uh, 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 affect that in your second pass. Absolutely. So let me ask you this, because we had talked about this, you know, millions of people were affected by job loss in the pandemic, especially students losing internships and jobs. And perhaps they had big dreams and plans to work in entertainment. Um, what advice would you give someone as far as be, staying optimistic and trying to find your way in this time? Well, uh, uh, to quote, uh, uh, I think it was 38 special, hold on loosely. If you grip the wheel too tight, now I've gone off the, their actual words, you're, 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 you can't, you have no touch. You yeah. have no ability to, you know, uh, react. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, you know, again, chase your dreams. And if you're having some success, keep going. If not, figure out why you're not having success. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to not have success, uh, start looking for something else. Maybe you can do it concurrently. I don't know. Um, but uh, I can keep a good attitude. Look for people who can uh, help. Uh, you uh, broaden your horizons work-wise and personally. Yes. Uh, you never know when a job's going to come along. You could be at a party, meet a producer uh, who, you know, remembers you because you were entertaining to them right. uh, uh, at the party. You had a nice conversation and, uh, you know, hopefully your, your agent, which hopefully you have, mm -hmm. uh, would be able to get you in to see somebody if a part was appropriate. Uh, it, 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 this is an uh, unprecedented time given this all this pandemic stuff. There was enough going on with with a with a, cor a vertical integration of corporations where, you know, uh, um, jobs were dispensed with because they fig figured they didn't need them anymore. As the corporation tried to figure out, you know, where to save their dough. Meanwhile, yes. the CEOs are getting paid a king's ransom. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I would uh, I would definitely look around. Uh, uh, and, and see, there may be an unconventional way these days sure. because things have changed so much. You yeah. know, uh, I, I don't think there are any hard and fast rules about how to do anything uh, in terms of getting into the business. Yeah, I will say this because um, I've spent some time doing this. I began doing a lot more writing, screenwriting. First, I studied it, but then I said, wait, I don't have to necessarily crank out a feature. Why don't I do some shorts? And that was a great use of my energy and my creativity in the pandemic. And then you can take those scripts and you could make them happen. You can shoot them if you yes. do it a small scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, everybody, the 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 old saying is, everyone in Hollywood has a script in their hip pocket. Everyone thinks they can write. Mm -hmm. I would say ninety eight percent of those people cannot write. Uh, and if you recognize that early enough, then you've gotten rid of one of your areas that you could be disappointed in yeah. but whether you write well or not if you can write something that you can produce then you're getting valuable experience whether it's good or not right uh, 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 and I know that sounds a little weird but uh, I often suggest to people new to the business go, go work on somebody's little movies you know you yes. hired people to work on your stuff probably for free yeah. Uh, and then they expect, a, a, you know, a, a reciprocal uh, uh, response from you when they ask you to work on their stuff, if they sure. if they did. Yeah. But uh, that's very helpful. Uh, taking a screenwriting course is terrific, at, at, if only to understand how it works. Right. Not necessarily to uh, be able to actually uh, uh, do the writing. Yeah. But uh, just keep keep your toe in every area of the business. See a lot of plays, go to a lot of movies, yeah. see good ones and bad ones. And, ha and then you have those, uh, you know, dinner, late night conversations with people about the business and stories that you hear and how they did this and how they did that. And, oh, I never considered that, that uh, you could actually, you know, uh, leverage that into something, sure. uh, you know, a story that somebody told or an approach that they took or a person that they knew.
Right. And tap into your alumni network, wherever you went to school, you know, there are yes. people that are probably struggling or can give you advice. I mean, I remember going to the SAG conservatory and taking their summer workshops and networking that way and learning different things. And then uh, AFI, they would, they would uh, submit your headshot and resume and I got cast in a few things. And just to have that experience to keep those muscles moving. Absolutely. And, and, and a lot of times I know I've had, I had uh, Syracuse kids call me up uh, in, in, over the last, uh, you know, since I graduated actually in 73, you know, asking for a, either for advice or a job or advice on how to get a job or could I, you know, take a meeting with them. And I did that whenever I could only because I wished someone had done it for me right. and it's helpful. It yes. can be very helpful. And, you know, if it, let's say you, uh, it's an actor, maybe you get them in to read for something and they haven't mm -hmm. read for anything professionally. Mm -hmm. Well, there's their, there's their first, you know, hit out of the box. And now they have, uh, it, it, you know, like in football, when, when you're a kid, you get that first hit, you're not nervous anymore. Now you're ready to go and, you know, exactly. play ball. Yeah. Well, that's why I started the series. Well, first it was to give people advice, not me giving advice, but having people on like yourself offering advice. But then I thought, let me open it up to students who lost internships and jobs. Um, and I'm looking to launch this pilot series where I actually align students with people in the specific industries they're interested in working. So they're not, you know, matched with somebody in an area they have no interest. That's great. And if it, I would imagine if that works properly, it should be an inverted pyramid of contacts and opportunities for people to meet to hear stuff, even if it's, uh, cause I think even after the pandemic, this zoom stuff's going to continue. I think so. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, at the very least you meet someone on online right. uh, uh, and get some, uh, insight there, yes. you know, from different areas where if you want to be a cinematographer, you get a cinematographer, you right. know, you can go visit somebody on the set. The set visit is very eye opening for the first time when people go onto a set and see, the number of people that are there, mm -hmm. the number of people that are just standing around that don't look like they're doing yeah. anything. Uh, and the professional nature of most sets and how they run. Yeah. What you don't know when you see that and what makes it look sort of easy is all the planning that went in to get them to that moment on the, on the stage. Sure. Of scheduling, yeah. of casting, of building of sets, of rehearsing of researching, of getting props, of, you know, you name it. So There's much. a ton of building blocks and a ton of people involved, totally uh, uh, a, a group effort. Yes. Well, I think, I know now's the time to be very compassionate to people because so many people are hurting. There's a mental health pandemic we're in the midst of. Yep. And especially what I discovered recently um, in the fellowship I've been in, we have college students that are affected with mental health issues. They're lonely, they're depressed, they're anxious. You also have an older generation that feels the same way because they've kind of been pushed. You know, they're in their retirement homes, they're kept safe, but everybody's feeling the same thing. And what I learned is when you bring these two generations together in some kind of meaningful way, it's a win-win. Absolutely. Uh, I, 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 there's nothing to add to that other than you've, you've observed the truth and, uh, you know, let's all uh, try and help uh, each other out because that's right. how you get through it, which exactly. is why when people aren't wearing their masks or haven't got vaccinated, it drives me wild. Yeah. Drives me wild. I don't understand it. But uh, then again, uh, without getting into an extended political discussion, I think we can blame that on one person for screwing up pretty much the whole world. By the way, how is Connecticut right now as far as um, openings and? You know, it's pretty open. Oh. Uh, like I was just down at the store, no mm -hmm. masks down there. Uh, the, it's, the, 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 the restaurants are open with no masks inside. Uh, some stores make you wear a mask uh, because they prefer it. Other stores say if you've been double vaccinated, no mask and, yeah. and pretty much wide open. Yeah. Pretty much wide open. I don't know about these new variants. I know this Delta variant and so scary. One. It is so scary. It really, I just read a story about a, a a a woman who was a writer who ended up taking her own life because she got COVID last April, and the symptoms, you know, the long haul symptoms for her were so debilitating. Oh. it was horrible, and uh, 
Yeah. Not good. Oh my gosh. Not good. I don't know. I don't think I had told you this. I was supposed to come to uh, New York City first Westport um, last March for a book talk I was doing, a book mm-hmm. I had written. And I decided, you know, I'm not going to come. Let me see if I can do it virtual. And then I found out there was some big party in Westport yeah, where there was COVID. Big spreader. Big spreader at the spreader. museum. I was supposed to have my book t- book signing there. Really? And, and then go to Manhattan. And, and I canceled like two weeks before this all came down. Well, Scary. Your, your, your angel was looking out for you because that was one of the big super spreader, Connecticut super spreaders. Early on, there was a party in Westport. That's, that was uh, it. And there was another guy in New Rochelle who was sick and, and spread things around. But uh, yeah, that was the very beginning of it. Yeah. Uh, we were in the city then and it was, uh, it was pretty weird. Streets were empty. Everything was shut down and strange. Wow, wow, wow. Have you been back in New York yet? Yep, it's getting, uh, it, we were just there the other day. It's getting pretty crowded again. Is it really? Yeah, and a lot of people on the street are wearing masks and in the stores because they they just, I think he, uh, uh, he said at 70%, which I think was yesterday or the day before, Okay. Uh, they would start to open things up and I guess they are. Okay. I, you know, I want to add one thing because having grown up in, I was born in Connecticut, lived in Manhattan and then back to Stanford, I would say to people watching this, especially if you're um, high school or college, take all kinds of different jobs that you find interesting. It's not a linear path. I mean, I did summer jobs where I worked at a dry cleaner for three summers. It was so hard. It was so hot in old Greenwich. And then I remember saying to my dad, maybe I'll drive an ice cream truck. And we (laughs) did the math. And he was like, no, you're not going to make money. And then I, I saw a sign for college pro painters. So I actually painted one of the buildings on the campus at King's School one summer, and then I painted houses. I mean, crazy job, right? But that could be great fodder for a a script. I mean, just those experiences. Totally. I had a similar experience. We, uh, when we graduated high school in 69, we uh, needed money because we wanted to hitchhike cross country. So we painted houses for a couple months and we're making a lot of dough. How do I and uh, when I say a lot of dough, I think I, I ended up with 300 bucks after <laughs> two or three weeks. That was enough to get me across the country with my thumb and yeah. a couple other guys. And that was fun. I worked at a country club snack bar, which, you know, it sounds like a, a, a movie. Yes. Actually, you know, like a Caddyshack kind of movie. Right. Uh, and the stories were similar. Um, but you're right. Take weird, you know, take uh, uh, jobs uh, that can just expose you to stuff you might not otherwise be exposed to. Yes. Um, and, yeah. uh, um, you know, you reminded me of something else that's now going to slip my brain. But it was about, uh, it, you know, in in prior to working in, in any business, you want to be smart. And if you go back to college, if anyone's listening, who's who's. Um, preparing to go to college and know and let's say you know you want to be a director don't don't bother majoring in 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 that stuff you can take those courses they're very important for exposure uh to things but uh major in english major in uh the arts humanities read the classic novels the classic plays go see plays uh uh and movies and uh and creative write, write, take creative writing courses. And that is a, as good a, a introduction to show business as you'll ever get prior to actually getting there and see how seeing how the nuts and bolts of it work. Yes. So don't be afraid to uh, uh, not major, for instance, if I can be real specific in, you know, the, the, in the communications field. Mm-hmm. Not, it's really not necessary. And the new house people will hate me for that. And their courses are terrific, but as an adjunct, in my opinion, uh, to, uh, to those things. So you can get smart and, you know, know ge- geography, know something right. about biology, know something right. about everything. Read the paper every day, mm-hmm. pick up a scientific American uh, and, and read some of those articles, read the articles in New Yorker. New Yorker has fabulous right. articles nice. in, in a huge uh, array of topics. Yes. No, that's great advice because the things you learn outside of your major are so important. I I actually didn't um, major in journalism. I didn't have great grades in high school. 
So I took classes in Newhouse, but I wouldn't have had the confidence to do radio back then. Right. So it's, there's nothing wrong with returning to things that you love when you're a little older and you have more to give to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally agree. And, and the only problem in, in, for me at Newhouse, you know, and I was really majoring there, I was in communications. I think it started out radio and television, then they changed the name before I graduated to communications, the school of communications. But um, I couldn't get into some of the courses I wanted to get into because they just didn't have enough room. Oh. Uh, and Syracuse was probably the preeminent uh, East Coast school uh, uh, for, for that kind of stuff at the time. And I assume they probably are still right up there. But uh, uh, don't worry about it if you can't get in. You know, exactly. you, you can always audit the course. Yes. You know, just walk in there and probably if there's 50 people and then they're not going to know. I agree. So. And then say, say yes to different opportunities. Sometimes I remember somebody in radio out here, KCRW, said, um, he just says yes to things. He might not be fully experienced that, but someone might see something in you that they believe you can do it. So I wanted to, I wanted to be on the, uh, on what's the uh, W A E R. Oh, but the guys that were on the station were such radio heads and kind of nerdy. And I thought, well, I, I didn't view myself necessarily yeah. as a nerd, but also they sort of had that, that, uh, the knowledge about, you know, putting the record on the turntable and, and mm -hmm. doing the, the, the talk up and, yeah. you know, reading this and that. Uh, I, I, so I didn't do it. And I regret that. I would have, I think that would have been fun. But, uh, you know, it's funny you should say saying yes, because Shonda Rhimes wrote a book called The Year of Saying Yes. I love that book. I didn't read it, but uh, I hear people like it. And, and uh, you know, knowing her personally, that is a little bit different. Uh, she's grown a lot. She, she used to be. It used to be all about saying no. Yes, that's uh, what I heard. Uh, uh, and and she's uh, you know she's done quite well for herself. So I was going to ask, what was it like working with her for so long? Uh, I I enjoyed it, except for the fact that the scripts were too long, mm -hmm. and she expected us to shoot the overly long scripts on the schedule, uh, and she would cut them later. OK. And when I say too long, too long by sometimes you'd have a cut that was 20 minutes longer than the show was supposed to be. Well, and you're talking about a 42 minute show. You're taking a huge right. chunk out of it. Yes. Um, but uh, I liked her decisiveness mm -hmm. and I liked her uh, storytelling ability. And I and I didn't like the fact that it was like uh, you're going to get it when you're going to get it. Uh, the material, mm -hmm. which is what she liked me for in the beginning, because I had come off of working with David Milch, where yeah. we never got material in a timely fashion. And when I say in timely fashion, sometimes not till the moment we were shooting the scene, wow. and come down and dictate a scene right there on the stage. But I told Shonda uh, uh, that uh, I could do it because she was tired at the end of the season when I did my first episode. And I said, eh, just give me a script when you can. I'll figure it out. Yeah, and she, she loved me for that. I'm sure she had faith in you. And well, that, that was her first mistake. <laughs> uh, I almost had a chance to meet her at a Ms. Magazine event and all these people were coming out from Gray's, but she didn't show. And someone said, oh, she doesn't really like to do press sometimes. She's, um, uh, she's you know what? She's gotten to the point where she's confident in be, doing what she wants to do. Yeah. If she doesn't want to do something, she won't do it. Yeah. I can remember being in the editing room with her uh, and we uh, the first grades that I did. And we were up there, it was a Saturday, as I recall. And I'm make, making this, you know, impassioned pitch for doing this scene a certain way. And I, and I spend my five minutes doing it. And then I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, this is not seeming to be uh, accepted. And I said to her, you're not going to do any of this, are you? She said, no. <laughs> and so I said, okay, so I'll stop. But uh, she, she uh, listen, this girl is a woman who's smart. Her father was a doctor. She went to Dartmouth. Yeah. You know, she has tremendous innate ability, uh, a tremendous compassion for people, she and does. is a tough cookie to yeah. boot, uh, and, and a softy to boot. So that's a lot of boots. It's a great, right there. great combo. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, she, and she's, you know, partnered herself with the right people. Betsy Beers is is her, uh, uh, you know, right-hand lady. And uh, mm -hmm. between that and now she's built the company even bigger. They're now up in the, uh, the, the, 
floor we had for private practice uh, over oh. at uh, on uh, Raleigh Studios. Okay, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's funny because suddenly I feel like I have a lot of stories to tell because uh, uh, my career is basically over. Uh, uh, you know, I, I can still do some stuff, but I realized, well, I look back, I said, kind of got to do a lot of stuff and you're in the middle of it. You're not really thinking about, oh, look, I'm doing a lot of stuff. Right. You're too busy doing the stuff. Just looking straight ahead. Why do product. you think your career's over? Uh, a variety of things, um, not the least of which is I'm 70. And uh, I, I did not... I don't remember working with a lot of 70 year old guys when I was coming up. So that's one thing. There is ageism in Hollywood, like there is in a lot of businesses. Okay. Uh, the diversity uh, thing these days. Uh, and uh, young people like to work with young people. There's certain things that uh, I'm not hip to. Like, what's, what does yeet mean? No idea. Okay. Well, <laughs> My daughter apparently is a word. It is a and, word, yeah. And, and all the shorthand uh, and texts and uh, I know and, and stuff. So uh, I, I like to keep my finger in that, and I have a tremendous uh, variety in musical tastes. You know, from classical to rap to to punk to mm -hmm. you name it. But uh, I'm I'm the old guy. I'm the old guy now, and I never it suddenly happened. So I, I another thing I will say is don't waste time thinking you're not ready to do something. Jump in and do it. Yeah. Uh, I never, I sort of still don't feel like, uh, 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 like I've been around a long time and know a lot of stuff. I sort of feel like, oh, kind of, it's over. And I did a bunch of stuff and, and uh, uh, I, I probably could have done more. In fact, I know I could have done more. Well, do you want to do more? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, but not really. Uh, I'm not impassioned to do it. Mm hmm at this point, I'm Maybe kind of the right enjoying thing hasn't happened the, for you at that right now. Say it again. I'm, Maybe the right thing hasn't landed for you. Maybe, maybe there will be something down the road. Maybe, but you know what? I, I'm, I'm grateful for what I had. And I feel mm -hmm. like I had several right things land for me Yeah, uh, and got hooked up with some tremendously talented people who uh, believed that I could help them make shows. Yeah. And uh, so there I am. Yeah. Uh, and, and here I am. Uh, and uh, uh, if if I know if I don't work another day, the only thing that's weird about that is that there was never you know an actual end like a graduation or uh, you know the gold watch. It's just sort of uh, not with a bang but a whimper, and I, I'm cool with that. I will say this though, and this comes back to my fellowship, that a lot of young people don't see the value in meeting with someone like yourself because of ageism. Mm -hmm. But some do. Are you drinking vodka? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, I used to, how many? Are your grandparents still alive? Probably not, right? Unfortunately, not. No. And did you have uh, meaningful conversations with them when they were still alive? With my grandmother, I wasn't close to my grandfather. Yeah. But didn't you sort of? Don't you treasure those now? Oh. Uh, the, yes. I don't know if your parents are still alive, but mine aren't. And I miss being able to talk with them and, you know, no, they're not. showing no. them where my son is or my, his grandson, right. Yes, uh, you know, and stuff like that. And, and uh, when I would go over to my grandfather's house, which I started doing way too late uh, when I was in college, and he would tell me all of, you know, his stories about growing up and being in the forest, uh, in the forestry business uh, in upstate New York, he was, uh, what they in, in Syracuse say is called stumpies, oh. uh, the, the, ag, the agricultural guys. Uh, and my grandfather was in the lumber business after that. And he told me about his, you know, he got a purple heart in World War One, And you just learn about it. He would flip me through his old picture books and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, talk to me about various people and adventures. And I love that. Uh, you know, you learn stuff from just life experience. It doesn't yes. all have to necessarily be connected to work. Yes. Listen to me pontificate. No, but it's true, though. There was there's a, a school here in Orange County where they connected college students at Chapman and the dance program with older adults at a retirement home who had all these stories about the Holocaust and going through depression. And the dance students put their lives into dance. They choreographed certain things to capture their lives. And it just brought everybody so much closer. And it gave the older adults a lift because they were feeling very isolated and right. disconnected. 
Well, that's, you know, Chapman, we know is a really good school and mm -hmm. to have that kind of program is terrific. Yeah. I, uh, I, I wish there was a way to kind of have, uh, you know, the way you see portrayed on television, you know, they have a, a, a you know, a, a comedian or a piano player, or somebody go into an old folks place, a retirement home and do this and that, you know, a yoga thing where they're, they're moving their arms. This is about the extent of their motion, sure. but where it could, turn the tables and you know, each one of them get up and tell a little story to an audience of much younger people because it does promote and provoke thoughtfulness that you might not otherwise you know, uh, uh, be in contact with. Exactly. Or, are you talking or, about I mean, younger people coming in and doing this? Or are you talking about the actual residents who live there? I'm talking about the older people talking to younger people. I go to a yeah. school. You right. know, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like career day when you're, you know, you bring your uh, fireman dad into sure. to class. Yes. You know, but you get people who are somewhat literate and, uh, and able to tell a tale that can at least keep, you know, some young people interested. Yes. Because God knows there's <laughs> uh, attention span these days is rather. Oh, brief. I know. I know. And a lot of it is this. Yeah. What? You know. Oh, well, I was, you know the name Sonny Fox, right? Sure. Okay. So I was, you what? Wonderama. Right. So I became friends with him years ago, just over the phone. Then we started having lunch and he passed away last year. Yeah, he recently. Got, he got COVID. Oh, really? And he was doing so well. Um, and I was just, we, we kept talking and he, he would say, you know, come visit me soon. And, and then I find out he got COVID. But the point is, I remember him telling me that he would get up and speak to the residents in his retirement home about things he had done, and he would get all these lectures, and people loved it. Um, and then he used to go to Manhattan and talk to the fans, um, the young kids, they were, they're now adults, and they would uh, just adore him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you're uh, uh, quite a bit younger than I am, but you know, he was a big deal on this Wonderama on Channel 5. Yeah. Uh, which at the time, I don't even remember what it was called because uh, uh, 11 was WPIX. Uh, but, you know, there was mm -hmm. a few guys. There was Claude Kirshner. There was Officer Joe Bolton. There was Soupy Sales. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, those days are gone of those local programs yeah. that and, and I'm sure he had a million stories to tell. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and people, you know, revered him. Yes. He was, yeah. he was an, a lovely man who, who, you know, kids loved him. Yes. And he used to do this thing in New York where he took uh, kids around the town and give them like tours of different gems of the city. It was really? a show. I forget what it was called, but I'll have to look it up. But basically he would, um, he had the, these experiences with the kids to show them different parts of Manhattan. Yeah. Well, that's like... Mr. Wizard, you know, Mr. Wizard used to teach, you know, science to the kids on TV and, uh, and guys like that, you know, they were always good. There was a guy in LA named Hugh Hauser who would do these shows on the local uh, public. I remember the name. And, and they were always kind of fascinating. And he was, what he had and which, you know, we've sort of talked about in other terms today is curiosity. Yes. And curiosity is really important. It sure is. Yes. You know? Yeah. The, just a love of learning and wanting to just be curious about life is so important. Yeah. I had a, I was on my walk uh, and my wife was there and I was talking to her about all these, all these things that fascinate me. Like, you know, this was all trees mm -hmm. and imagine the primitive shitty tools that they had to knock all those trees down, to build their houses. And then they worked their ass off all day to, you know, to, to clear the land, to, you know, to, to grow right. their food. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's starting to get dark. They got to figure out what are we going to eat tonight? Do, do, did we kill something we can eat? Yeah. You know, and then jump to putting people on the moon, television, telegraph, combust, mm -hmm. combustion engines, uh, you know, to yeah. fax machines, uh, all, all, I'm giving it all out of order, but how did that happen? How did they do that? How did they figure it all out? And I'm just curious about that. I'm curious about people going West, you know, and, the, and all of the, that they had to endure to get from the East coast to the West coast in those days. Yeah. And just in a few hundred years, so much has happened. Absolutely. Do you give any talks around Connecticut to students? I only give myself pep talks to try and 
you know, tell myself to stop spending money on landscaping. You don't need so much. Right. No, I haven't done any of that, although I certainly am open to it. And uh, I've been asked uh, a few times uh, in California to do some of that stuff and have done it. Oh, good. Good. Have done it. Well, if people want to find out more about your work, is there a website or somewhere that, I mean, they can Google you, obviously. Yeah, the, the, I don't have a website. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, have a, I, I'm, I put stupid stuff on Instagram that makes me laugh. Okay. And, uh, and uh, I, I check in on Twitter to get my daily fill of uh, pit, uh, political vitriol. But uh, uh, um, no, just Google. And then um, I would suggest don't, don't worry about me. Look at the shows. You bet. Uh, look, at a, look up a guy named David Milch. And look at the speeches he's got all over the internet. He's a fascinating guy. Stephen Bochco is another guy you could look up. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, any of the people that created shows that you liked, you know, like uh, Jim Jim Burns or Jim Brooks and Alan Burns. Uh, uh, I love Billions, by the way. Yeah, Billions is great, isn't it? Wow, Aaron Sorkin. Yep, and that is, is Billions. Aaron Sorkin. I thought it was. Maybe it is. I don't know. I, I've loved. Let me look it up while we're while we're here. Look it up. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, and that's coming back on this fall. Oh my gosh, the casting, the writing. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Oh, you know what I should have done? I should have. I'm still. Go ahead. Ask me another question while <laughs> Brian Koppelman. I don't think that's. Uh, There's three it, people. I thought there were three executive producers. I thought Aaron Ross Warren. Sorkin. It's his brother. Oh, his brother. Brian Koppelman, David Levian, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. That's he, it. That guy writes for the uh, Wall Street Journal too. Okay. Or maybe it's the New York Times. Maybe. But maybe. Uh, yeah, you had you were right, half right. Half right. I'll give you the whole thing. Okay. Fifty percent is your Hall of Fame. That's Baseball Hall of Fame material. Five okay. out of ten. Excellent. Well, I have really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for taking the time, Mark. My pleasure. I'm I'm uh, I'm here. I don't have anything to do, so <laughs> call me anytime. <laughs> that might change. You never know. That's true. Yeah. That is true. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>